Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord for the uh, talent and work and effort the Lord has given our church. And uh, I'm going to tell you, a lot of it goes unnoticed. And uh, you just need to thank Brother Mark sometime for all the work that he puts in for putting all the music together and all the choir and all the orchestra and all that stuff. You need to say thank you every once in a while and for the Lord, what the Lord has used him to do here in our ministry. And uh, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10, and as we continue through the book of Hebrews, um, and when you found your place, if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. Somebody asked me uh, this week, so pastor, are we starting on Hebrews chapter number 11? I'm like, no, we got two verses left in chapter 10, <laughs> and uh, that's, a, that's a good 45 minutes right there. And uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, and uh, we're going to begin, we'll read back uh, starting in verse number 34. And uh, go down to verse number 39. Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says, For ye had compassion on me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture. Lord, that you would just give us wisdom, illuminate to us the truth. Lord, we thank you for your word and how it helps us, how we need it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply ourselves to it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You would not typically think that the time that you would tell people that they are uh, most blessed or they are most privileged or uh, they have the best is when they're going through their worst. But in reality, sometimes the, the times that you understand the most that you have or, or the value of what is around you is when uh, things are going in a chaotic sense or things are difficult and you realize, wow, I have more than I thought I had. And these Hebrews, uh, remember we looked at last week, that even some of them had been counted dead by their family. Their will had been read. Though they were yet alive, their will had been read and their, their stuff had been spoiled. Their stuff had been come and taken and, and, and given out to the rest of their relation that had considered them dead. And, and Paul, is, or the writer of Hebrews here, is reminding them that, listen, you, are, you counted it joyful. You counted it joyful watching this happen, knowing that there was a greater reward in heaven, you were able to have a perspective of the greater value that was coming over the current situation that you were going through. Then he says, and it's coming. There is coming a day. He is coming. And so don't cast away that great confidence that you have because there is a great recompense of reward. Well, when's the reward coming? Well, it tells us, if you look at the passage, it says this, for if ye have need of patience... If you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. See, in our, in our society, we want the prize to be put up front. If you'll give me what I want, then I'll do what you want me to do. Right? And sometimes kids do that. You ever had your kids come in and say, Mom, I love you so much. And the natural response to that is, what do you want? They figure if they put the prize up front, if they put the favor up front, then they'll get from us what we want, you know? And in reality, that's not the way it works. The labor comes first, and the prize comes after. The work comes first, and the benefit comes after. That's the way it is in most of life, right? The work comes first, and the benefit comes after. Well, here we have what Christ has done for us. He has secured the benefit already because he did the work. He secured the benefit already. Hey, friend, heaven is mine already. He is mine already. 
He is my Father. Christ is my Savior. I am His brother. That is already now have been set. My name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have a place seated in the heavenlies with Christ. I am in Christ and He is already there. And so though the benefit has already been established because the work's already been done, the promise has not yet been completed. I'm still living here, aren't I? He says, so I want you to understand, the promise is established. There's a recompense to the reward. So go ahead and have confidence. Though you have not seen the benefit yet, though you have not tasted all the complete benefit yet, it's already established. And he's going to give them these words. He's been cultivating this in them through these chapters. Christ is better. Christ is sufficient. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. He's better than the angels. He's better than the temple. He's better than the high priest. He's better than all these things. And so don't lament and don't fret. And let me remind you, he is watching. He's cultivating, cultivating, because he's about to give them a charge. He's about to say, I've given you enough information. Now I need you to live the information. And a lot of times in Christianity, man, we just spend so much time circulating about the information. Circulating about the information. At some point, we have to live the information. And so he says, I'm telling you, the recompense of the promise is laid up. The reward is there. Be confident. And also, be patient. The promise has already been guaranteed. It's just you have to run the race. Then he gives this phrase. Look what he says in verse number 38. Now, the just shall live by faith. Three different places this is quoted. It's quoted in Romans, quoted in Galatians, and quoted here in Hebrews. The just shall live by faith. It's a quotation from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And so we're going to go do some work in the book of Habakkuk. If you don't know where Habakkuk is, it's way in the back. No, I guess that's the front. That didn't work. It's in the back of the Old Testament. And if you make it there, if you find Obadiah and Jonah and Micah and Nahum, you'll find Habakkuk. Okay, if you need to, there's this thing in the front of the Bible that you can look and you say, it'll tell you what page it's on. Okay? In the book of Habakkuk. It's one of the minor prophets. And here's the basic premise of the book of Habakkuk. So before we read it, let me just give you the background. Habakkuk, this prophet, is looking at the rebellious nature of the nation that he's living in. He's looking at the rebellious nature of the nation that he's living in. He basically prays this. God, are you awake? Are you paying attention to this? Everybody's living wickedly. Nobody's doing righteously. Enemies are, are abundant and they're, and they're winning. God, are you going to do anything about this? And then God says, yes, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to judge and he lays out his judgment. And Habakkuk goes, well, I, hold on a second. I, 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 didn't, I didn't really mean for you to do that. I, mean, I, I, I was just kidding about that whole judgment thing. And God said, no, no. There is a judgment for sin. It kind of flows in what we've been talking about in the book of Hebrews. It says, Christ is sufficient, Christ is sufficient. But remember... Remember, O oh people, God, is a, it is a dangerous thing to fall in the hands of a mighty God. It's a dangerous thing for us to, to have our sins be judged by God. God is still just. Amen. So what do we do when the circumstances are negative, the surroundings are weak, and I feel frail in accomplishing what God wants me to do? This is the backdrop of the book of Habakkuk. He says, man, nobody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. I don't feel like I can do what I'm supposed to be doing. God, are you going to do anything? God says, yes, I'm going to judge him. So what do I do? And Habakkuk is waiting, listening. And this is the response that he gives in Habakkuk chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 1. The anticipation. Habakkuk says this, I will stand upon my watch and will set me a the tower, set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I will answer when I am reproved. Man, this is a side note, but if you could come to church this way, this would be awesome. If I could come to church this way, if we could come and say, I will stand upon my watch, I'll put myself upon the tower and when God speaks to me, I am ready to be reproved. Man, what a difference that would make. And so Habakkuk says, okay, I've made my plea. I've made my cry. I've come. I said, what do I do in the face of impending judgment, in the face of difficulty? He says, I need to be reproved. Verse number two, and the Lord answered me and said, 
write a vision. Make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. We're going to come back to that. For the vision is not yet for an appointed time. At the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it surely will come. It will not tarry. That's exactly what Hebrew says. Hey, there's coming a day. It's going to be completed. It's going to be finished. He said, though the promise has not been made evident yet, it's coming. Believe it. Says this in verse number three. And verse number four. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. Reading that, you think to yourself, wait a second, I, I, wanted, a, I wanted some encouragement here. I wanted some encouragement. Here's the first encouragement that he gives. You ready? The reason you're having so much difficulty is because you're so full of yourself. I didn't say that, he did. Don't get mad at me. He said, the reason you're having so much difficulty is because you're full of yourself. Have you ever enjoyed a pity party? Man, I have enjoyed. I, there's been times that I was just grumpy and I enjoyed being grumpy. And I did. My kids would come and try to cheer me up. I'm like, don't cheer me up. I'm enjoying this. You feel a sense of justification. You were angry. You felt you know, I had the right to be angry. So you enjoyed being angry. Man, and you're like, yeah. Imagine somebody coming to you. You're angry. Or you're bummed, or you're bothered, but you feel justified based upon circumstances, based upon situation, and they come to you and say, you know what the problem is? You're too prideful. Oh, baby. I'd be like, me? Me prideful? Did you know what they did to me? Do you know what they said? And justify, 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 justify. But the problem is, because of my pride, or because of my agitation, or because of my anger, or because of my depressed nature, or because of my discouragement, though I may have reasons for it, I was not moving forward. I was not moving forward. I was justifying not going anywhere. That's the way it is. When you're angry, when you're grumpy, and your wife says, you want to do something? You say, no. Would you like to play a game with the family? No. Would you like to go for a walk? No. Well, would you like to do something? No. What do, I, what do you want to do? I want to sit here and be angry and be happy about it. I'm glad that like half the audience is like, yeah, I understand that. And the other half is like, oh, you're a, you have problems. Yeah. But I, that's justified. Well, this is what they were doing as a nation. This is what they were doing as a nation because of what was happening around them, because of, of the flow of enemies and difficulties that they were going through. It, they were justifying their sin. They were justifying the fact that they weren't serving God, honoring God, pleasing God, and praising God. They justified the fact. It's not my fault. How many times have I heard people say, listen, I'm never going back to church because so-and-so. So in other words, you let that person stop you from serving God, pleasing God, praising God, and honoring God. And I say, your problem is not them. Your problem is you're full of yourself. You're so full of yourself that God doesn't have any room in your heart. He said, those that lift up, this is what it says in verse number four, behold his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Those that lift up and justify. Not, then he gives the second thing. He says, but the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now we need to do a little bit of definition. Because sometimes we, we misdefine the idea of the just. We say the good shall live by faith. You know, the, the perfect shall live by faith. Those fancy Christians shall live by faith. The ones that have all the answers shall live by faith. No, the word just literally means those that are right before God. Those that are right before God. Well, how do I, a sinner, get right before God? I put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I recognize my guilt before him. I recognize my sin before him. I get on my knees. I humble myself and say, God, I am guilty. I am a sinner. I am bound for a sinner's hell. I have no hope of heaven outside of you. You died for me. You shed your blood for me. Will you please forgive me of my sin? I put my faith and trust in you. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they are justified. The old preacher says, it's just as if they never sinned. They're justified. No, they're not, they're not perfect. They're not without error. They're no, they're no fancy people. They're just people that recognize their need before God and act upon it, acted upon it Amen. and asked him to forgive them of their sin. Amen. The just shall live by faith. But what does that mean to live by faith? What does that mean to be able to accomplish the task? Live by the strength that we have in Christ. What is the expectation that he has for us? Well, can we go back and look at verse number two? This is the expectation. God's going to give an answer to a wayward people who are struggling in response to the sin and circumstances that are around them. And, he, and Habakkuk says, well, what do we do? What's the answer? And the Lord is going to compare. You can live by pride, self-reliance, or you can live by faith. You can live by your religious culture. I'm good enough, strong enough. I'm, be I'm better than everybody else. Or you can live by faith. And this is the expectation he gives. He says, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. That he may run that readeth it. That he may be able to accomplish, that he may be able to soar, that he may be able to turn from his pride and be able to accomplish all that God wants him to have. It is in the writing of Hebrews that he's quoting this and he's about to, you guys, probably the most familiar chapter that anybody has with the book of Hebrews is Hebrews chapter number 11. Called the Hall of Faith, some have, some have dubbed it. I'm going to tell you, you know what it is? It's people that ran in response. People that ran in response. They ran with the power of God. You say, well, man, they must have been really, really great, wonderful, perfect people. No, some of them were fairly miserable. Some of them were weak. Some of them found themselves wayward and found themselves in sin. But when confronted, they humbled themselves before God and responded in faith. And God allowed them to accomplish and run. The ultimate goal that God has for the Christian life is not for you to maintain. The ultimate goal for the Christian life is not for you to avoid the big sin. That's not the goal. The ultimate goal in the Christian life is not for you to be able to be viewed by others as being pious or, or religious or special. The goal that God has for the Christian life is for you to be able to operate by faith and run to accomplish the will of God. Those that run need to know where they're going. Those that run need to have a finish line. Can you imagine a race? We were at the, the TRC race the other day. And there they go. Start. And they all start running. And Marianne looks over and somebody wasn't in their place. And so the whole place was going to turn and run the wrong direction. And there Marianne, she was off like a dart. No! Go that way. We need direction. And they were able to turn and go the right direction. Hey, if you're going to run, you need to know where you're running to. You need to know what you're doing. It needs to be done by faith according to the word of God. And I'm going to tell you, the obstacle to your faith is not culture. The obstacle to your faith is not everybody else's sin. The obstacle to your faith is your pride. That's the obstacle to your faith. That person who lifts up him, himself, the Lord said, he is not upright. The obstacle to your faith is not recognition of your strength or recognition of your weakness, but it is recognition of your strength. The obstacle to your faith is the idea that you don't need God every day. You don't need God on a daily basis. He's about to give us, this is so important, he's about to give us in chapter number 11, example after example after example after example, that those that simply began a life 
were able to be accomplish all that God wanted them to do because they operated by faith, because they ran, because they were willing to abandon pride, because they were willing to abandon self-dependency and become completely dependent upon Christ. Do you know why some people cannot take that final step and accept Christ as their Savior? Because they can't abandon their own pride. They can't abandon their own pride. Well, what pride? Well, when, when Christ saved me, the Bible says he bought me with a price. I am his. And praise the Lord, he is mine. Amen. He gives me a command. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. Amen. Some people don't want to give up their life. But in reality, until you give up your life, it's not going to be saved. They're unwilling to abandon pride. And they use circumstances. Yeah, but what about family? What about culture? What about religion? All these things. Hey, while well, as long as you hold on to your pride, you will cease or you will be unwilling to give your life and turn your sin over to Christ and let him forgive you. You will remain in your pride and it doesn't matter what you do to try to lift yourself up, you will not be upright. And all the Christians said, yeah, amen, preacher. Get those people that need to get saved. Get them. <laughs> but you know it's the same problem for Christians? You know why you're not being successful or I'm not being successful on a daily basis to walk in the joy of the Lord, have the joy of the Spirit, and to be able to accomplish what God wants me to do, to, to be able to proclaim His goodness, to be able to enjoy the abundant life that He has given. You say, Preacher, you don't understand. My life is not abundant. He is abundant. In Habakkuk, this is not, this is not written in good circumstances. This is written in difficult circumstances. In Hebrews, this is not written in good circumstances. This is written in difficult circumstances. And in Habakkuk and in Hebrews, he says, but those that depend upon Christ can live by faith. In fact, they can run. They can accomplish all that God wants them to have. Yeah, but you don't understand what I'm going through. Yeah, can I, Lord, help me say this the right way. I don't, want to sound, I don't want to sound rude or arrogant or anything. I really, I don't. You're probably full of yourself. I know that's my case. When I don't have the joy of the Lord, it's because I'm full of myself. I'm self-justified, self-enamored, self-dependent. And I'm not operating in dependency upon God. He has written all this book of Hebrews to try to come to get these Hebrews to come to the place. Listen, all you need is Jesus. All you need is Christ. Trust in him. Trust in him. I think I thought of this and the different uh, people that would be that would be here and the different groups of people that would be here and those that would be so hindered in running because they're so concerned about their circumstance. And we live in a culture in a day and age when young people, they, they, they're so inundated by their culture and there's such expectations on them and, and there's such concerns about perception and acceptance and all these things that so often the idea of abandoning your life and giving it to Christ is something they're so unwilling to do because they don't want to be so out of the norm. They don't want to be so out of the, uh, the accepted. And they don't want to be different than everybody else. But in reality, the just shall live by faith. And in fact, they'll run. They'll run. Because their looking of Christ will be far more impressive to them than all those pressures that they begin to feel and they begin to have. And they will abandon pride because that's really what it is. Your concern about being accepted, your concern about adapting to your, it's pride. It's pride. You say, all oh, the old adults, say, get them, preacher, get those young people. They need to give their life to Christ. You know, the problem is young people grow up. You know, the problem that, that people have that have families and kids, they're too busy and too burdened to give their life to Christ. They got too many things going on. They got too many problems and they got too many things that are consuming them and they, they're, they're bothered and they're concerned all the time and they're, they're weighed down. And you say, well, listen, it was, it, I, it was so much easier when I was a kid. That's what the speech we give the kids. Just wait till you grow up and things get hard. Right? Yeah, and they may get harder, but it's still not an excuse. 
You should live your life by faith. You should abandon all those things and abandon your pride and put your faith and trust in Christ and say, God, your life is the life that I need. I want to serve you and honor you and please you and praise you in this culture that I live, in this world that I live. I, I, have put my, I abandoned my pride and put my faith in you. I don't want to be lifted up. I want you to be lifted up. Sometimes the kids look at the adults. Can I say this kindly? And they think to themselves, if that's what life with Christ is like, maybe I should look somewhere else for happiness. And the adults look back at the kids. Well, one day you'll understand why I'm depressed. One day you'll understand why I'm so angry, and you'll be angry too. Not the just that live by faith. Oh, preacher, you're painting a rose-colored picture. You don't understand. We go through problems. Yes, Yes, we do. That's why we need faith. But in pouting, we never move forward. We go in circles. Go in circles. Can I ask you a couple hard questions this morning? And I'll be done. These are my questions. What are you doing that is of faith? The Bible says that which is without faith is sin. We're going to see in Hebrews chapter number 11, without faith, it is impossible to please God. What are you doing that is being done in dependency upon Christ? Well, preacher, I don't, I mean, I don't have any big thing. No, 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 no. You're, you're missing the point. It doesn't say the just shall overcome the most difficult parts of their life by faith. It doesn't say the just so save up their faith until they really need it when something super bad comes. It says the just shall live by faith. That's today. That's tomorrow. What are you doing that's of faith? What are you doing that is by necessity self-deflating and Christ-exalting? That's what Habakkuk chapter, four, chapter 2 verse 4 says. Self-deflating and Christ exalting. When's the last time you kept your temper by faith? I mean, that little kid made you mad. I mean, oh, they just, mmm. And the Holy Spirit says to you, hey, don't respond in pride. Deflate yourself and respond in faith. And you responded in faith. I can give you plenty of times that I responded the other way. Plenty of times. Oh, if you really want to know, I can bring my kids up here. They can give you times I responded in pride. But when's the time you responded by faith? When's the last time that in a chance to be offended, you deflated yourself? And responded in faith. Amen. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know what they did. My neighbor's a jerk. They may be. If I'm your neighbor, they are. <laughs> I promise. But that doesn't change the fact that we're supposed to live by faith. Amen. When's the last time you purposely, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, deflated yourself? This is what I want to do. This is what I ought to do. Oh, I feel like I should do this. You deflated yourself and you responded with faith. When's the last time you made a choice that benefited somebody else because you deflated yourself? And you didn't do it to get the praise and glory of others. You did it to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Deflated yourself and exalted Christ by faith. I remember one time back in 1974. No, 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 no. You're supposed to live by faith. Which means you were supposed to do that yesterday. And today. And tomorrow. Well, preacher, if I could just get a few things together. If I could just get that raise. If I, if I, if I, could, just get, if I could just get my life together, then I could live a life by faith. You'll never do it, friend. 
You'll never do it. The life of faith is not the life of convenience. The life of faith is not the life of no difficulty. The life of faith is knowing how to respond to difficulty, endure difficulty, and exalt Christ through difficulty. But there has to be this emptying of self, exalting of Christ. Emptying of self, exalting of Christ. To be controlled by the Spirit. The Bible says, Paul says, there is a, a struggle that goes on between the flesh and the Spirit. They want mastery. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter number 6, you can't serve two masters. There has to be a, a serving of the one, a choosing of the one, a rejecting of the other. And if you're not in the process of choosing to serve Christ and choosing to live by faith and saying, God, I'm going to accomplish and purposely abandoning pride and emptying of self. Listen, if you only live by nature, you will live out your nature. And your nature is not one that's going to please Christ. Often we hear preaching from Ephesians chapter number 6 about the battle and putting on the armor of God and being able to stand. And yes, the, the devil will throw his fiery darts and I'm going to go stand against my culture. I'm going to go stand against sinfulness. You know who you need to stand against? Your own pride. And my own pride. That's who you need to stand against. And you will not be able to stand until there is a willingness to deflate self and exalt Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is what God says. Those that read it, they'll run. They'll run. Those that heed it, oh, they'll run. It's amazing, the parallel, because chapter number 11, he's going to start talking about that. Chapter number 12, He's going to start talking about that. Let's run. Those that are filled with pride will not get anywhere. They'll make a throne and they'll sit on it. And they will rule their little kingdom with great authority, but they will accomplish nothing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, preacher, you're kind of preaching a little bit hard to us today. Well, actually, to be honest with you, I'm kind of preaching a little bit hard to myself. You just get to watch. Amen. Because pride is a battle. Have you fought it? Are you fighting it? I remember one time last year, preacher, I really struggled with that. <laughs> if you haven't struggled with pride since last year, you are very prideful and blind. <laughs> it's a battle. You have to run. You have to choose. You have to have a purpose. You have to wake up running. You have to hit the day running. You have to continue through the day running. Not based upon your ability or based upon your righteousness, but based upon that which is of faith. Knowing the Word of God and reading the Word of God and taking those things which I have learned and, and those things which I have been taught and exalting them and being a doer of the Word, not just a hearer only. Christian can quote a bunch of diatribe of religion, but can they do it? Can they do it? It will not be done until there's a deflation of self and an exaltation of Christ. Deflation of self and exaltation of Christ. And that's what he writes in the book of Habakkuk. Those that lift themselves up shall not be upright. But the just shall live by faith. What have you done that is of faith? The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 14, that which is without faith is sin. Man, there's a high demand for living by faith. So let me give you a definition. If we're going to live by it, we kind of have to know what it is, right? This is the definition. Faith is knowing what the Word of God says and believing it enough to do it. See, it's not just good enough to just have faith. You hear people talk about, I have faith. I have faith. You have faith? You have faith in what? I'm living by my faith. What, do you, what does that mean? 
Faith is knowing what God's word says and believing it enough to do it. Amen. Now, let me just give you a couple applications. I'll be done. First of all, we have developed this attitude that the only person that's really supposed to have the knowledge of God's word is the preacher. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to about theology, and they'll, they'll argue some point, and they'll say, well, my preacher says, mm, insufficient. You, as a believer, have a responsibility that if you're going to live by faith, you have to know God's word. You have to know God's word. You have to read God's word. Oh, I, I read it once, preacher. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. I've read the Bible. <laughs> <clears throat> You're supposed to live by it. That means you're supposed to be consuming it all the time. Taking it all the time. Taking it all the time. I've been a Christian for 20 years. I know what the Bible says. No, 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 no. no you're not living by faith. You're living by tradition or you're living by remembrance. You may be taking God's word in afresh like the manna. It was good for that day, but you couldn't store it up for tomorrow. If you saved it for tomorrow, it would be rotten by tomorrow. You got to take it in every day. You got to take it in every day. Take it in every day. If you're going to live by faith, you've got to know what God's word says, and you've got to believe it enough to do it. If you're going to live by faith, then you need to be in constant communication of your humility to the one that can give you the power and strength to do it. You need to be on your knees. You say, preacher, all that preaching and what you come back to is read your Bible and pray? Man, if I could write a book, I'm going to write a book and sell it in all the bookstores. How to live the Christian life. It'd have two chapters. Read your Bible and pray. Amen. Now, you've got to be more than a hearer. You have to do it, right? That's where the faith comes in. Faith is not simply the consuming. Faith is believing enough to do it. Amen. To live it on a daily basis. Well, preacher, when I'm confronted with a big faith decision, then I hope I make the decision of faith. No, no, you're confronted with a big faith decision every time you make a decision. Every time you make a decision. Christians have compartmentalized their faith. I have a faith decision box over here, and then I have a work decision box, and a family decision box, and a hobby decision box, an entertainment decision box, and I have all these boxes over here, and every once in a while I go over, uh, <clears throat> let me make a decision that is by faith. No, 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 no. Faith is the box. Your family decisions need to be made in that box. Your work decisions made in that box. Your entertainment decisions made in that box. Your life decisions made in that box. Your temperament decisions made in that box. Your response decisions made in that box. That's right. Every single decision that you make will be a decision of pride or a decision of faith. Every single decision. You're just going to be more likely to make a decision of faith if you do it on purpose. The just shall live by faith. This is not by accident. Oops, I accidentally did what God wanted me to do. No. If you make a decision by accident, you're more likely to make a decision that's based in pride. Because that's where our bent is. That's where our nature is. Okay? Example. We're sitting down for dinner last night. We're having Tr Truman's birthday dinner. We have steak. We have salmon. And my first thought is, I hope everybody else gets their pick. I'll pick last. Is that my first thought? No. It's not my first thought. My first thought is, you touch that, and I'm going to put a knife through your hand. That's my first thought. And so I took some steak. Mm. I gave Truman some. He's the birthday boy. I took some steak. And I was so engaged in that. I was so mm, eating it. It was so good that I forgot to get any of the fish. And I look up for fish, and the fish is all gone. <laughs> Decision number two. Find out who ate the last piece of fish and throw them out of my house. <laughs> That's my first response. But I had to think about it. It's not the right response. 
I didn't get any fish. He's like, preacher, you, you let something like that bother you? Yes! <laughs> I cooked the fish! It was good! I wanted some! And in that moment, thank the Lord, I've been reading this passage, and I've been reading this passage, and I've been reading this passage. And in that moment, it was, what are you going to do? You're going to get angry because you didn't have fish? Boy, won't you look like an impressive person then. And I thought, I don't need fish to be happy. I have abundance. I have family. And you can ask him. I'm using myself as a positive example. This is a first. <laughs> I did something right. I was like, I didn't get fish. This steak is sure good. You see, that's just such a silly example. It really determined how the rest of the night was going to go. It really determined how the rest of the night was going to go. Because I'm a person that can get upset over fish. And when I get upset over fish, the kids are going to know it. And the wife's going to know it. They're not going to spend time with me. And I don't really want them to spend time with them either. They ain't my fish. <laughs> the rest of the night would have been ruined. Why? Because I went out and committed adultery? No. Because I went out and, and got drunk? No. Because I went out and, and gossiped? No. It's because in that moment I had a pride choice or a faith choice. Amen. And if we would consider our small decisions of great priority, because those steps determine whether we're living by pride or living by faith. Most arguments don't start over something major, they start over something minor. And somebody makes a pride choice that produces more difficulty and more difficulty. Most of your burdens and discouragements are not over something major, they're over something minor. I found this, sometimes it's actually easier to have faith in great trouble than it is in minor trouble. Everybody runs to God at the funeral. But many, I'm sorry, few run to God Monday morning. Many run to God in the hospital. But few run to God in the celebration. Yeah. That's why the book of Ecclesiastes tells us in chapter 7, it is good to go to the house of mourning. For the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. For the living shall lay at the heart. And he says to us, you, you people, live by faith. Allow it to let you run. I don't know if, 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 if that it will sink in in a way that is necessary, but it's important because chapter number 11, he's going to tell us what running looks like and how to do it. This is not for the mighty. This is not for the swift. This is not for the great. This is for those that would be willing to yield themselves to the Spirit. Amen. That's us. That's us. I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you the impact that it will have in your home, in your church, in community if you would deflate yourself of pride and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says it this way in Philippians. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but let each esteem other better than himself. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Live by faith. Living by faith is not for the great. It's for the believer. You look at Hebrews 10, look what it says. The certainty that he has. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul will have no, no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. He says, we're not of those who are religious 
who operate and then, and then leave and deviate. Let me tell you who we are. We are those that believe the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient. Lord Jesus Christ has cleansed us of our sins. We believed it and our soul is saved by it. So why don't we live it? Man, the writer has so much more confidence in us than we do. And he just says the just shall live by faith. Or we would we be willing to live by faith? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us.